I had to do it over, right, and I wanted to start a grooming side hustle, what would I choose? What would I avoid? Knowing what I know now. Today I'm actually going to share with you some insights. I'm going to tell you, in my opinion, what the best options are if you are somebody that wants to start some type of product side hustle in the grooming department. We're going to be talking about shave. We're going to be talking about body care, all right? We're also talking about grooming, tools, fragrance. We're talking about stuff I've done. We're talking about men's makeup for men. <laughs> Don't do that one. Someday I'll tell you the story. Anyway, I got all sorts of tools, gadgets, and gizmos that I want to talk about because there are some that are winners and some that are big, humongous losers. I'm super excited about today's video and it really was inspired by the White Label Empire, right? Because I was thinking to myself, I'm like, if I were to start over today, like from zero, all right, what would I do? What products would I actually come out with? What kind of tips and tricks have I learned over the years that could basically help me kind of hack the system and get to the front of the line because I've tried a lot of things and I've seen a lot and I've tested a lot of different products and so everything from beards to skin to body to deodorant to fragrance like hair like you name it I've tried it right and so I thought today I'd actually share with you some things some tips some pro tips not to mention some don't do's in order to help give you some ideas or insights because I know that a lot of people like the idea of basically starting a business around something that they love or something they're passionate about right that's the whole way that Pete and Pedro started right actually hang on a second uh where is it? <laughs> Everything's not like super organized in here. Okay, here's one. All right. American Crew. It was American Crew that was kind of like the inspiration for Pete and Pedro, right? I was sick and tired of basically like one or two of the products being awesome, but then, you know, some of the other ones weren't that great in terms of styling aids, right? And so I decided to go to the lab. I went to these different like white label, private label manufacturers. I tested a bunch of them and I found a line that I thought every single product was a winner. And as the story goes, I basically ordered, uh, I think it was 96 units of five different products. I started Pete and Pedro for literally $3,000 out of a spare bedroom in my house. Anyway, it was white label when I started. Now it's all custom formulation. If you're interested in starting a business or going down the rabbit hole of starting a side hustle, guys, white labeling, private labeling is, in my opinion, the lowest hanging fruit right now. There are other businesses that are amazing. You know, drop shipping is kind of okay, but there's nothing like building a brand because you have a lot more flexibility. You can scale it. You can grow it. You can do some amazing things. Like Pete and Pedro this year will do $10 million. And like I said, I started with 3000 bucks. Anyway, if you haven't checked out the white label empire, I'm going to link to a free 20 minute video tutorial that will walk you through step by step the process of starting a white label or private label business and the cool thing is that even if you want to go like custom with anything that you want to do whether or not it's sunglasses or like t-shirts or whatever right I also show you and teach you how to do that because honestly the process from going white label to custom is basically like one or two steps um, Anyway, I'm going to link to that down below. All right. Bottom line though is white labeling is amazing. What is not amazing are beard products. All right. So that's the first business I would definitely not start if I was starting over, right? Beards are hard and there are a few reasons it's hard. Number one is a lot of dudes, even if they have a beard, they're not going to spend money on their beard, right? In terms of a beard oil or a conditioner or a balm, right? The market just isn't there like it used to be. It used to be a lot more trendy, a lot bigger. Now, the one option and opportunity, in my opinion, if you wanted to go beards, is Amazon. Amazon you can still play with because Amazon is kind of like a different animal, right? That's its own shopping platform. And so you know if you wanted to create some type of beard oil or beard product or beard wash, you could sell it there. Trying to build a standalone brand is going to be a lot more challenging. But competing with some of these other popular beard oils or products, you know, you have a lot better chance because the market isn't crazy not saturated. Now, something that isn't saturated as well is men's makeup, all right? This one right here, Strix. I know the owner, I know the founder. And uh, at the time, I thought it was an interesting business when they launched, right? They got into CVS, they did a few other things, they got into, where was it, like Nordstrom, and they also got into Target. And the problem is that not enough men at this point in the US are interested in wearing makeup. Even if you call it like a spot treatment, right? It's still makeup in the eyes of American men. And so this product, even though they basically came in and there wasn't much competition, they basically started to grow, but it was a very difficult business, all right? The other problem with a product like this is you've got different skin colors, right? And so if you wanted to come out with like a concealer tool, right? What are you gonna do? You've gotta have not just one, right? This one that I have right here is like white dude, like number five, right? 
<laughs> if I'm a black dude, I can't do it, right? I need a different one. And so they ended up having to basically really like diversify in terms of adding a bunch of different SKUs. The one thing you need to understand, guys, when it comes to business, the more inventory you've got to hold, the tougher it's going to be. Because honestly, like inventory is kind of like the devil. You got to think about cash flow. Cash flow is the lifeblood of business. And if you're having a bunch of cash tied up in inventory on the shelves, it's not moving. You can't do anything with that money. And so this product, it basically, it came in, they were early. Um, there were other companies that tried to basically do like makeup for men and they all haven't really figured it out. And so that's another warning sign. If you're the only one in the game, chances are you shouldn't be in the game. Do I look sexier, younger? I should probably put it under my bags. <laughs> anyway, why? Well, because, you know, there are a lot of people and the markets are out there and if somebody has tried it or if they haven't or if there's nobody in there, you're gonna have to basically fight harder. Why? Because of the educational process, right? Educating the consumer about how to use a product, what a product is, this is expensive. You know, with a beard oil, right, the work has been done. Everybody kind of knows what a beard oil is or what it does. Unfortunately, the market, in my experience, isn't there. Pete and Pedro has a line of beard and shave. It's just a tough game because there are a lot of competitors. Now, that's something else, right? Competitors. If there are too many and the market is too saturated and you try to come in and compete on price alone, you're going to lose, all right? The reason and the way that you are going to scale, the reason and way that you are going to build any business is brand. It's all about increasing the perceived value and building a brand that is profitable, all right? So beards, I would say loser. Makeup for men, I would say loser. Shave in general is a really tough category and it's not one that I would get into, right? Unless you've got something special, unless you're doing something niche, and that's something else we got to talk about, right? The riches, as they say, are in the niches, all right? There's a company, I, I think it's called like Freebird, that does like, head like shavers along with, wait, I think I actually got sent one because that's the thing. They went to China. There's a manufacturer that basically they white labeled this head shaver thing. And I actually, where is it? I got one somewhere from my manufacturers because that's the thing. Like when you're starting a business, right? You find these people on Alibaba or like wherever there are other websites. But um, anyway, you basically just say, hey, send me all your shaving. And I got a bunch of like shavers for like face and um, I got that thing with the three things that they actually started a business with. Something else I got, I can't find it right now in this mess, but I also got like the Manscaped like little like pube trimmer too, right? All of these companies that you are familiar with started typically private label or white label, right? They just got a product and then they started and they grew. And then as they grew, they basically modified their design or had things custom made. But uh, hang on, where is, uh, where is, Ah, this isn't, this isn't it. This isn't it, but here's just an example, right? Look at that, right? Yeah, yep. Yeah. That's one of the shavers that I got from, from China when I was thinking about doing some type of grooming business um, in terms of tools. Now, the downside to grooming tools, whether or not it's one of these or, you know, like one of, one of these, the whole manscape thing, or even like, like a beard grooming tool, right? Because I've looked at those because I was like, hey, it kind of makes sense, right? I've got a grooming company and guys are into beards and I'm always promoting like different, actually one, the Rio Beardscape. Well, I wonder if I can do that, right? And so I got a bunch of samples and I found some grooming tools that I love, right? Unfortunately, the downside, once again, is inventory. How much are you going to have to carry and how expensive is that one individual unit? Because you got to make sure that you've got enough margin in the game. And so if I were going to do like one product in terms of the beard realm, I would definitely, I don't know, I guess it would have to be, I guess it would have to be a beard grooming tool, right? I love beard grooming tools, right? I love the Brio, Beardscape. We've talked about that a bunch of times, right? But what they did, and I think was really smart, they went narrow. They went really narrow and deep as opposed to wide. What do I mean? Well, when you go narrow and deep, that means you're having one product and you're really doing that one product really well as opposed to trying to come out with like, you know, 10 beard oils or whatever it is, right? The downside to that business, like I said, is that it is, it's expensive to carry that inventory. But if you are going to go into the beard business, I think that is a good idea. But the one thing you gotta make sure is you gotta just make the experience and the product more premium because people will pay for quality. Another example of a tool that just fucking crushed it, and I know the owner is this. It's the back blade, right? It started with this, right? It was this idea, it had these little mouth things, and you do that, and then he evolved to this thing. That dude was selling like, I think it was like almost a million dollars a month on Amazon with these things before he actually sold the company. And now, 
What is the learning? Well, if you go and solve a problem, right? If you look at back shavers on the market, there aren't a ton of them. And so he went with an idea that was real simple. I believe he had it patented, right? But he designed something that solved a problem. A lot of dudes have trouble, right, trying to shave their back. And back hair removal or back shaver is a very highly searched term on Amazon. And so he basically came in early and he crushed it with this product. But once again, he went narrow. He didn't go real wide. He didn't have a ton of products, all right? Uh, another product that I love, uh, deodorant. Deodorant, right? I love deodorant in terms of a business, right? There's a company called Native you guys have all heard of. Well, Native's whole game was creating natural deodorants, right? And they basically would sell them in like a kit. You could buy a few of them. They were on subscription and they crushed it. All right, why? Well, a few things. Number one is the fact that they, once again, they were narrow, right? They weren't doing like deodorant and then they weren't doing like moisturizers and all sorts of things. One thing, deodorant. But they made a few different scents and they made it natural, right? And then they, I think at the time they had like three different ones, three different scents. Well, basically they focused. They focused on one product and one thing that they wanted to sell, which was natural deodorants, right? And they knew that the deodorant market was big and natural deodorants was tough because most natural deodorants suck big, hairy, unmanscaped monster nuts, right? And so what they did, they went to the lab, I'm assuming, and they basically had one formulation done and then they just added a few different scents. That's one of the other things you gotta understand. It's not that they had to formulate like four different ones or five different ones, it was one base formula and then they just added a few different scents a fresh scent, a woodsy scent, and maybe something else, right? I'm not remembering exactly, but I do remember getting the samples when they first launched. And they sold to like a big company for like, like, I don't know, a few hundred million dollars. Anyway, I love it. I also love the fact that I think that there is more market availability. And one of the things that I did at Pete and Pedro, I created my own natural deodorant, right? It's a custom formulation. And the one thing you gotta understand, whenever you're doing any type of product, you gotta listen to feedback. And so I launched the first version, it smelled amazing, it didn't last long enough. And so I went back to the lab and I said, hey, we need to figure out how to make the longevity or the staying power a little bit better so that people don't stink like as soon, right? And we retooled it, we reformulated it. and that's one of the things you got to understand. You're going to have to change and modify whatever you do by and based on the consumer feedback, all right? Don't think that you're right 100% of the time because if they're getting it and they're telling you, yo, it needs to last longer, it needs to be better, you need to listen to them because they're going to rebuy. Speaking of lasting longer and being better, let's now talk about fragrance, all right? These are two samples that I have made, all right? So, did you hear that? Deodorant, if you wanted to go natural and do some type of like subscription and really focus there, I think there's a lot of opportunity on Amazon or just as a company. I think deodorant, I think it's good. It's kind of like soap, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, but fragrance, right? Everybody likes the idea of fragrance and so did I, which is why I started at Pete and Pedro. Now, how would I do it differently? Well, basically, if I was starting a fragrance-like brand, I would make it more premium, as opposed to trying to go like super cheap, all right? Now, the good news with fragrance, the profit margins are insane. It doesn't cost that much to make a fragrance. You know, whether or not you're using something like more affordable, like, 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 like Dolce & Gabbana, or you're doing something like a Tom Ford, right? Basically, these fragrances cost about the same, but if you're going into the store, this is gonna be what, like 60 bucks? This is gonna be a few hundred, all right? It's all about the brand. Once again, it's about building brand, it's about building presence, it's about building an audience, and the cool thing is that with fragrance, you know kind of like who the influencers are that you need to basically reach out to in order to start selling it. Now the downside to fragrance is it's tough to buy something that you've never smelled. And that was one of the beautiful things that I did with 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 Pete and Pedro, right? I basically tied fragrances and told everybody like up front, yo, I'm not a fragrance house. I just want to smell sexy as hell. And so what did I do? I basically said, hey, I love Creed Aventus. And the cool thing is that everybody knew kind of what Creed Aventus smelled like or have heard all these dudes on Instagram and YouTube and everything freaking out. And so it took a lot of the buying reservation away because people knew that everybody loves it. So even if you can't afford it, which most people can't afford a $500 bottle of fragrance, you still are willing to try it if it's under $50. And once again, the margins are insane. And so that was one of the big, like awesome things that I did. But, uh, but one of the unawesome things I did was come out with some fragrances that didn't have a high enough perceived value. Um, anyway, 
What perfumes the Marley, look at them, right? They're a relatively new fragrance house, but the bottles are sexy. It's all about the experience, right? The caps are big and the fragrances are great, right? And the thing that I love about a brand like this is that they really went like deep first and then they started to expand and go wide. But if you were looking to start some type of profitable business, fragrance is a crazy profitable business. The downside of fragrance, here's another one, ready, is the fact that you can't typically ship it internationally because it is a hazardous flammable material. It's alcohol, essentially, the majority of it. And so you got to remember and think about where and how you're going to be selling. So if you think that your audience is all overseas and then you realize you start everything and you think, oh man, I'm going to sell it. And then all of a sudden you get the realization that you can't unless you set up some type of distribution distribution over like through Amazon over in Europe or whatever there are ways to hack the system but just selling you like right now like in the US selling overseas you can't do it vitamins supplements Woo! I love this business I love this industry all right whether or not it's something like a multi or something like like this joy mode right maybe a little testosterone boost gentlemen here's the deal supplements I love it why well a lot of reasons it's light it's consumable, and that's another thing and another pro tip. If you're creating something, all right, a business, like a t-shirt, how many t-shirts is somebody gonna buy in their lifetime? Exactly, all right? One of the things you gotta think about when you're starting a business is, can they buy it multiple times, right? Can I set it up as a subscription? If the answer is yes and yes, then good news. Supplements are one of those things that once you start taking it, basically you get into a habit, all right? Now, when it comes to supplements, what I personally would recommend is target something that guys are interested in, whether or not it's hair loss. There's a company, Nutrafol. Boom! They blew up. And all they sell is basically a hair healthy multivitamin for men and women. And they exploded, right? Or testosterone. Big L's. Anything technically like related to wieners. Like, I'm telling you, next level, right? Or if there's some type of bodily issue or problem that a lot of guys have, maybe that's something to go into, all right? The deal is they're easy. You can white label them, you can private label them, or you can go custom. One of my, for actually the first custom product that I ever did was a fat burner. Back in the day, it was in like 19, like 99. Um, I created something called Metabup. It was a clone-ish of something called Metabolife. It was very popular fat burner back in the day. And so I went to the lab, I worked with them. I said, no, add extra L-carnitine, a little bit of this. Here's the bottles and I didn't sell much because I didn't know back then how to market it. It also was kind of like before the internet was like super, super, super huge. But bottom line is supplements, in my opinion, are good. This brings me to something I want to talk about, black dudes. All right, <laughs> black dudes, black women are underserved. All right, and this is something you gotta understand. There's a company called Bevel, right? Bevel blew up, they exploded. They started basically with a safety razor, right? Because a lot of African-American men, right? And like men that have like coarse, like curly hair would suffer from like razor burning bumps. And the problem of using something like a Mach like 87, it's got 27 fucking blades, right? And every blade is like a pass. And so what they found is that if you're using like something like a single blade safety razor, you're not gonna basically get as much ingrown hairs. It's gonna be a more comfortable experience and it's gonna be better. They started targeting African-American men and then they added some other things and then they sold for like a hundred million dollars. Anyway, in my opinion, if you are targeting and have a business that focuses on a specific demographic, I think this is amazing. And that demographic, in my opinion, is one that is very wildly, in my opinion, underserved. And so if you are coming out with like hair products or skincare or like whatever, right? Grooming products or tools to solve a problem for that clientele or that demographic, that, in my opinion, is a monster. Something else that's a monster is Soap. So I got lots and lots and lots and lots of soap. All right. Uh, reason I have so much soap is that when we decided to actually make a soap, um, I went to my lab and I said, hey, uh, give me some of the soaps that you guys make. I want to test. I want to try. And that's one of the other things. When you're actually working with a manufacturer, whether or not it's a contract manufacturer or um, a private label situation, right, you can ask them, say, hey, send me some of your samples. All right. It's what I did with sunglasses. I got samples and then I saw, okay, I like this bar because of this. I like the, the way how much exfoliant it has. I like the look of this one. I don't like this because it's a little too scratchy, right? You get the sample and then you get to give them feedback and that's what we ended up doing. Um, think about another company. Can you remember? Another company that really started with soap, natural soap, 
that blew up? Mm, yeah, exactly. Dr. fucking Squatch. Boom! Exactly. Now, why did they blow up? Because they got it. And they also figured out the content or the marketing game, right? They made amazing commercials and ads that they ran like Top Funnel to basically get themselves out there. Dollar Shave Club. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go old school. Dollar Shave Club, amazing business, right? Actually, it was a shit business. They never made any money, but they ended up selling for a billion dollars to Unilever. Why? Well, because they had a ton of customers. Unfortunately, they never really figured out the customer acquisition game in terms of how to do it at a profitable CPA, but they had like 2.5 million subscribers, right? But that dude, Mike, how did he start it? He didn't build or invent blades. He went to the company Dorco, and basically Dorco makes blades, right? Lots of blades and you can buy them and that's what a lot of people, actually, I think, I've got like, I think these are probably Dorco. There's tons of companies that sell Dorco blades, right? A lot of your blades for Dollar Shave Club that you find, not maybe not now, but in the old days, they basically fit on, on different razors. They're the same blades, right? Because Dorco. But what they did is they said, hey, here's an agreement that we want to do with you that we are the only company that is allowed to sell your blades on a subscription model. And that's the reason why they basically like kind of came in and cornered the market. Anyway, what they did, they figured out that content, right? That top funnel video, the ultimate video was that Dollar Shave Club video, right? It was amazing, it was amazing. It was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. And what happened is they created a piece of content, it went viral, and then boom, their business exploded. And then they tried to add a bunch of different products because that's what you do, right? When you start a business, a lot of times you'll come out with one product, right? But then in order to increase your AOV or your lifetime value, of that customer, you start adding a bunch of products, right? And so they blew up and then they sold, but then they basically like, they never figured out actually how to make money. Guys, you've got to start a profitable business. Anyway, I don't like shave. What I do like though is soap. Soap is another one of those things that I personally think would be an amazing business. It's consumable, it's not super heavy, and you can compete hard on Amazon, all right? So Amazon, you gotta think about that as its own like sort of shopping system. Now, in my opinion, you gotta think about sales in two different ways, right? You think about Amazon as one vertical, and you think about your .com or your direct-to-consumer business as another, and they operate differently. The profit margins are different, all right? now. Another business that I love is obviously skincare. What I know now, <sighs> skincare is still, I feel, a great business. T. Shanley was early on. When we started, there was basically like Jack Black, right? They made amazing products. They still make great products. They also sold for like 60 or $70 million to a bigger company that actually also bought, where are they? Uh, not Billy Jealousy, uh, Bulldog. Have you guys heard about Bulldog? Um, I don't know where the hell it is. Anyway, they sold billions, uh, not billions, I think it was like $60 million. Um, Bulldog also got sold. They were like a cheaper like version of, of skincare. But anyway, I still love skincare. And I really feel like if you're targeting a specific demo, you could do well. Another thing that I know would do amazing is T. Shanley for women. All right, women are, in my opinion, a better customer than men. And that's something else you gotta understand. If you can figure out something to sell to women, do that. Because there are a lot more female influencers, micro influencers that would love to talk about your product. There are ways to reach out to them that are quick and easy and I teach you that in White Label Empire. Anyway, women are better consumers. They're less, less price sensitive and they also are very brand loyal. The other thing that women do that guys don't is talk about the products they love. Dudes don't talk to other dudes about, oh my gosh, have you tried the Roman swipes? They're incredible. <laughs> Sex and money. If you can figure out how to get a guy more of either one of those, you're gonna be a millionaire like super quick. All right. Um, because that's honestly like what a lot of guys are worried about. Anyway, women, they talk about different products, right? Things that they love, they share them all the time. Oh my God, these are my favorite, right? Maybe not like woo, but dudes, you never see them doing that unless they're getting paid. But anyway, um, women, the market, if you can figure that out, awesome. Uh, some other things that I love. So skincare I still love. I think a subscription is great, but having the ability to really sell on Amazon, like T. Shanley, our business on Amazon has exploded. And the one thing that we did early on that we basically modified or changed throughout our business journey is at first it was just the system. It was the, just like the smaller size products, 30 day supply. But then once we started getting feedback and listening to our customers, you know, we realized that a lot of guys don't use certain products or want to change products or want to use more of certain products. And so when you started to actually listen to your customer, you realize you've got to change or modify. And so that's when we went to like full size containers, full size bottles and sell them individually on Amazon. We have a very different Amazon T. Shanley strategy than we do the dot com business. But 
Anyway, skincare I still think is amazing. Another one. What else? What else? What else? What else? You want to talk about? You want to? You want? You want to talk about hair? All right. Um, hair products I love. I love them. I think they're amazing. But it's hard. That business and industry. If I had to do it over, what I do? Hair products. Knowing now what I know then. The meaning, knowing now what I didn't, you get what I'm saying. <sighs> Ooh. I would say, I would say probably no. Why? Because hair is hard. Uh, also, now there's a lot of competition, right? But what I would probably do would change or tool, retool and formulate kind of my methodology and my strategy. Because I still feel like there is opportunity but it really depends on like what you're doing. You know, the African American market, I think is something that is underserved. Um, I would focus on specific products, right? What I know now, I know that people, guys like volume, right? So things like texturizing powder, sea salt spray, volumizing shampoos and conditioners, like things like that and going niche. I think I would try to leverage and utilize Amazon and that platform a lot more because I really feel like if you come out with some great standalone products, you could crush it. Right now, if I were to try to start Pete and Pedro, right, it's hard because I've got such a big, like huge, like monstrous amount of different SKUs and in inventory, which the truth is I probably need to pare that down and I'm in the process. Another, another idea is, uh, is body wash, right? Where's body wash? This one is from the grooming lounge, all right? The scent is, uh, let's see, black pepper, invigorating black pepper. Where did they get that idea? I'll tell you, Molten Brown, right? There's a body wash company. They sell premium body washes, and that really is what they started and what they focused on. They did one thing really well. If there isn't a message in this whole, like, video, like, rambling, like, all over the place, like, tutorial, is if you can go more targeted, that is going to be a better opportunity because it's more specialized. And what Molten Brown did, they made really sexy premium bottles. I don't know that I have any here. I probably used it. <laughs> anyway, um, Molten Brown, they, they, did, they did the body wash. They did the body wash thing incredibly well, right? And then what the grooming lounge did, because they were in the business of basically selling a bunch of different products, is, oh, that's the number one best-selling product. And so if we're coming out with our own body wash, we're basically going to copy that scent because we know that dudes like it, and that's what they did. Um, the downside to body wash or anything like big, right? Like, oh, the downside to Axe is that <laughs> it sucks. No, I'm kidding. Uh, you smell like a 12 year old boy. Um, the downside to body wash, I'm looking for more anyway, is that it's heavy, right? And you got to think about that, right? 16 ounces, 15 ounces. That's heavy. That's like a pound that you're shipping, which is something else you got to think about. And that is weight. How much does it weigh? Because you got to get it places, right? If you're shipping it, that's one of the unsexy costs that you got to understand is going to add up the heavier your product is. And so if it's light, that's better. All right. One of the products that I came out with that I love, that I still love is the teeth whitening strips, right? They were amazing. They were light. They were affordable. They started like as like a private label. It was awesome, right? The problem with that, there were a lot of problems with that, but I still think that that, the teeth whitening, blackhead removal, like things like that, problems that people have, I think is still like wide open, right? If I were going to create a product like teeth whitening, blackhead removal, like combo, like that would probably not be a good like connection, but you get what I'm saying, right? I think that oral is hard though, right? In terms of like, if you were coming out with like a toothbrush or uh, or like, or toothpaste, I think it's hard, right? Because what are you going to charge for a toothpaste versus like going to the store and just buying a tooth? Most people aren't like brand loyal to a specific toothpaste unless it does something special, right? If you're going to start a toothpaste company, I would go like super like whitening, right? Or um, yeah, probably whitening, right? Because people want whiter teeth. That's how the whole like, like charcoal toothpaste thing, teeth whitening, like whitening your teeth is still a game. And I think that it's great because it's very easy to demonstrate on a before and after, right? Anything you can do that you can basically show the before and after problem that it solved or the results is also another huge opportunity. All right. Whether or not it's, you know, flat hair to volume hair or 
like acne skin to clear skin, right? Acne is still really great too in terms of a target market that I think still has a huge potential because there aren't that many players and it's also something that people suffer with. If you can solve a problem for somebody, right? Whether or not it's help them with confidence or their insecurity and make them confident, it's something that you can basically scale to the moon. What's this? Oh. <laughs> Here's another one, right? Here's, here, okay, well, maybe not. What about this, right? Tongue scraper, uh, <laughs> tongue scraper, right? Got this from China, you can start it. I mean, selling things like this on Amazon, like that's the whole like Amazon, like FBA, like game, right? You basically are finding products that people are searching for, making them nice, getting them from China, and basically selling them and competing with some of the other brands, right? This is a perfect example of a tool that you could do that with very well. Um, you know, other than that, like brushes and things like that, the good news with things like brushes and things like tools, they don't actually go bad and they don't expire, which is something you also got to think about. If you've got inventory and it's going bad, you can't sell it. And if you can't sell it because it went bad, you literally burnt dollar bills. Anyway, that's where I'm going to wrap things up. I know it was a lot, I know it was rambling, but I just wanted to give you sort of like my thoughts and insights based on my experience. Once again, that is what you get with the White Label Empire if you guys haven't joined yet, right? Every week we go deep for two hours on Thursdays. Um, they are recorded so you can watch later, but we're in there helping, engaging. My goal is simple, to help you guys build hugely, wildly profitable and successful businesses. And that's one of the things I wanted to share with you today is, you know, a lot of people get excited about certain things because they're like, oh, this is awesome, right? It is awesome, but making it a business and it being awesome are a lot of times two different things. You gotta make sure you connect the dots. Hopefully you dug this video. If you did, drop the video on one of these. If you want more help, join the White Label Empire, link below.